Um, so today we're going to talk about what's new in Veeam Backup for AWS and Microsoft Azure. Uh, I'm Niels Engler, Senior Product Manager at Veeam, responsible for AWS. And uh, you know they also gave me Azure. Thank God for that. I'm joined by Andre today, who's going to do the Azure part, and I will focus on the AWS part. Um, all right, technical difficulties, but it works. Uh, quick agenda. So what we're doing first, doing first is discuss what's coming in VeeamBaker for AWS, then Azure, and then there's also a very important part around our platform updates, what we're doing with the Veeam data platform in terms of our public cloud products and solutions that uh, you should be aware going forward in the future, um, you know, starting from in a month from now and ongoing, et cetera. And at the end, there's Q&A. If you have questions, you know, raise your hand. We'll, uh, we'll try to make it work. Uh, we're still here for the rest of the event, so if you want to talk one-on-one -on -one or want to have meetings, feel free to come up to us. We can arrange something. So let's dive into it and make it uh, you know, straightforward about Veeamback for AWS. So I think most of you went this morning to the keynote, and there was a session or a slide by Anton about how we are adding more workloads into our products. Um, and there's no difference when it comes to the public cloud. So most of you who are using public cloud are well aware that there are thousands of workloads nowadays available. Um, you know, talk about EC2, RDS, et cetera. There are so many things. And we see a lot of them in the field. So one of the workloads that we are going to add in this release is around Amazon Redshift. So for those who don't exactly know yet what Amazon Redshift is, if you're an Azure user or you're going to AWS and you want to know what this is, actually it's a very simple workload or service to use. It's a fully petabyte-scaled petabyte data warehouse. So you can throw whatever data you have in your organization, throw it in there. If you're using databases, um, file shares, you want to use it for analytics, throw it in there, and it will help you give you insight in your business, which allows you to you know, grow your business, build applications on that, listen to your customers, analyze what your customers are saying compared to what you're seeing in your infrastructure, and build whatever you want based upon the feedback. And this is currently available in two different types. So you've got the older model, which is Redshift clusters, and the newer model, which is serverless, um, you know, when there's no servers involved in a way, I guess. Um, if you look how this looks in a diagram, so as I said, it's a scaling model, whether you're an SMB, an enterprise, mid-enterprise, anybody can use it. It scales from a few gigabytes or even megabytes, which we do in our labs, until petabytes of data. So it's completely easy to use, and it's recommended to go for serverless um, or the cluster model up to you. It's used for data sharing, and once the data is in there, just use it with regular SQL queries and see what the data is actually in there. So your developers can utilize it and then utilize the technology of self-learning, AI, machine learning, and everything like that to analyze and improve your business. Um, there's integrations with a lot of external monitoring tools like Apache Spark on the slide. So it's a fully sizable utilization for data warehouse. So what we will do is we will allow you, of course, to back up your data in there. We will make backups of your Redshift clusters, store them in AWS Backup Vault, so everything stays in the ecosystem with native APIs. And we will use our typical approach, which is a full backup and then always incrementals. Once the backup is made, what's more important is that you can do restores for full clusters or you can go back to a specific point in time. Now, Redshift is one of those workloads that we see, but the other one that is very hot nowadays is around FSx. And Amazon FSx is a file system, just like you have Amazon EFS. But the difference is where EFS is a native solution created by Amazon, within FSx, they give you freedom to choose. So if you're a Windows fan, fine, create a Windows file server. If you're a Linux guy, use Luster or OpenZFS. Are you a NetApp family, and do you have NetApp on-premise with ONTAP? Use FSx with ONTAP and extend it from on-premise to in the cloud, use it for data migration. You know, do anything that you want with it. Um, it's hybrid enabled and it allows you to do anything uh, in terms of file movement between public cloud, on-premise, you name it, you can do whatever you want. And when it comes to what we are doing, we're gonna back up those things. All right, your files are important, you need to be able to restore them. Um, again, storing them safely within the AWS ecosystem by using backup vaults, 
full backup, incremental method. And what you'll see is that across our cloud products, we have a very similar approach, similar policy design, similar backup design, similar restore design, just to make it easier for you for the ease of use. Once your backups are done, with FSx, there's a little bit more options in terms of restores. So you can go to another location, you can go back to the original location, you can go to a different account. So if your developer wants to play around with some new type of application he's made, and you are afraid that he may break a few things in the production account, restore it to a different account, don't give him public access, make it private, and he can play around, break stuff, you just delete it, and you're good to go. And in the first version, we'll support Windows, Luster, and OpenZFS. So if you're using NetApp ONTAP, sorry, we are going to add that in the future. Uh, if you do use it, you know, come up to me. We'd love to talk about how you're using it, um, that we can you know, enhance our capabilities on that front as well. Now, you know, slides are one thing, and talking is fun and stuff, but like, anybody wants to see demos? There we go. All right, not my laptop, not a Mac user, so bear with me. You can help. <laughs> How do I get that on the screen? Now we need, we need to change something. I don't know. And then I need to drag it around. So you see it's live, we're not joking around, not videos. Nope, wrong slide. Any technical support? <laughs> How the fuck? Can you mirror our screen? Like, just mirror it? Do I need to push a button? Doo -doo -doo. What's that? No, that's, that's not it. But I think they, they need to change their layouts. Escape. Ah. Okay, there there we go. See, technical help. Give him a round of applause for explaining to us we have to do one button. <laughs> All right, here we go. So as I said, everything is live. Um, pray with me that the cloud doesn't go down and that I don't have to call support at AWS because then we have a bigger issue. Um, so what we have in here is the UI for VMback for AWS. So for those who've used it, you've seen it before. If you haven't used it, it's a very simple based uh, web-based UI. And um, the way we've divided it is you've got your policies divided by workload. So you've got EC2, you've got databases in which we support RDS, DynamoDB, and now Redshift. Then there's file systems, and we also have support for protecting your VPC, which is, of course, the core of your infrastructure, which is your network stack. So if we look into those policies, what you can do is pretty straightforward, is you first of all have to define a name you define whatever you want, right? I call this Redshift policy backup. I can call it Vmon. I can call it my awesome demo. You know, name whatever you want. But what's more important is when you want to protect things, you have to select your sources. So you specify an IAM role, which is an account that has access to your resources. You specify which region you're going to protect. And in this example, I'm protecting data that is located in Frankfurt. Again, we support all the available regions. Doesn't matter where it is. You can add whatever you want to make sure that your business is protected. And here and here, in the next step, I specify the resources. Um, and we've made this quite easy that you could say, you know what, I don't know exactly what my developer or my product team wants. I'm going to protect everything. Um, but in this example, I'm protecting specific clusters directly by providing their name. Once it comes to the protection part, and I specify my targets, I specify where I want to store this. And in this case, I'm protecting my data in Frankfurt in a backup vault. As I said, everything stays natively within the ecosystem of AWS. Got to make them happy and you know, earn some money, of course. On the schedule step, I've defined how many backups I want. I'm not going to go in full details here, but basically it allows you to do GFS, so grandfather, father, son principle, with daily backups, weekly backups, monthly backups, and yearly backups. And in my example, I've said I want one backup per day, and I want to keep this one for three days. Again, this fully depends on what your protection policy is within your company. Um, I have specified that in my backups, I also want to have a tag. So if my backup is created, you'll see that there is a tag being added with my name and called Vmon Demo, which can be used for, for example, billing if you're a service provider. Um, it can also be used to track stuff what's going on. So tags, you know, everybody knows what tags do. They have a very large, um, you know, advantage to be used in your product. 
Now, let's hope that I can also do an actual restore, because what good is a backup if you can't restore? So here you see that I've got two backups. I made them earlier. Let's say I'm going to restore this one. The way it can do is you select the restore button. I can go back in time and change the restore point, so I could go back two days. As I said, I've got three days of backups. I say which account to use. This one, again, has to have permissions to perform the restore. Um, in this case, we've kept it simple. I've got an almighty administrator account, which I will not recommend to anybody um, to do, but please be aware that you can do it. Restore it to the original location, or I can change some settings if I want to, fully customizable. But you'll see that if I go to the next step and I fill in a reason, that in a matter of five clicks, I've done my restore. So I can type in, for example, vmon, click next. And if I click Finish now, what will happen in the background, the restore will start. Um, I'm not going to wait for this. And of course, there's a warning, um, which is usual in a live demo. But what will happen is the background, the restore starts. And in a matter of a few minutes, it will be back available. So that's how we do it for Redshift. Now, as I said, we're also adding FSx, which is a file system. We already support EFS. Now we've got FSx, another tab on there. And in here, you can see that I've got a policy. To go to the policies view. And these policies, you'll notice that they are very similar for the ease of use. There's no point in making an airplane because anybody in here who's the pilot and can control an airplane, maybe one guy who does it as a hobby, I don't know. But what we like to do at Veeam is keep it simple, keep it straightforward. And again, I specify a name, I specify my sources, and you'll see it's exactly the same. I give an account that has permissions, I select which region I want to protect, and I specify which resources I actually want to protect. So in this case, I have a FSx file system, and I will protect that for a specific time. Now, with FSx, we have some more options in terms of protection. I've got my local backup within the region, but I've also said, you know what? If AWS goes down, Let's make a copy from Europe, in this case from Frankfurt, all the way to Canada, right? And if something goes wrong, I can still restore in Canada and have everything back up and running in a matter of a few minutes. Schedule step, exactly the same. How many backups do you want? How many backup copies do you want? Um, free and flexible as you want to use it. And then, of course, the more important part, again, is the restore. You'll see I've got my uh, FSx system protected. And you'll see the steps are exactly the same. You specify the restore point, an account to use, specify where you want to go, original location or the new location, and then you fill in the reason and you're good to go. So you'll see that our product at that point is simple and easy to use, right? We don't want to make complex things. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. Let's see if the demo gods allow me to do it. Which button? Hmm? Where's that button? There we go. Right, so workloads is, of course, one thing. Um, but as we grow and get feedback from all of you as customers or partners, we also make other enhancements on our products to make your life easier. So. One thing that you've seen this morning in the keynote is around security, right? Security is always important. It's no secret that every release we update everything in our products to make sure that we're using latest versions of products or third-party services that we use just to ensure to you, you know, things are safe. You won't get attacked by a zero-day exploit or something like that, or even worse, by ransomware attacks. There have been then, we've also done some scalability enhancements. For example, you can easily protect 10,000 virtual machines or EC2 instances. Uh, you can go up to 500 FSx file systems. So there's quite some numbers. I won't go into the details because I know that everybody will fall asleep by that, but they will be available in our user guide. We've done some user interface enhancements. Um, but what's more important when it comes to, for example, RDS is that we've added new features in there as well. We support now the latest Postgres. So for those of you who are using RDS with Postgres, know that version 16, which was recently added, is fully supported with our upcoming release. Um, and RDS, the file system or the, the devices, the volumes underneath are using GP3 nowadays. We've also done extra tests and additional verification there to fully support that as well. So RDS is now fully up to date, fully supported with all the latest and greatest by AWS. And with that, I'll pass it to my colleague, 
to go over the other cloud, which is Azure. All right. So now a little bit of Microsoft loft. Uh, let's talk about Vim Backup for Microsoft Azure, uh, version 7 that is upcoming. OK, so obviously we're going to start from workloads. Um, I'm going to give you like three major things for the release, and one of them arguably the most important one coming next. But then three things to remember. So first of all, if we're talking about workloads, we're going to support Cosmos DB. Um, for those of you, I don't know, from like AWS side of the world, it's kind of equivalent to DynamoDB. Um, what I'm saying with that, it's um, NoSQL database, um, which is typically good whenever you need to run, I don't know, like social media platforms, you are operating with terabytes and petabytes of data, it's really easy to scale it out. So the way how Microsoft promotes it, it's whenever you're thinking about a database that is you know, scale out database being really good uh, horizontal scaling, it's Cosmos DB. And um, yeah, they guarantee the speed of um, at any scale, basically, regardless of the size. Um, they give you a, a lot of availability for uh, the database. And yeah, it's uh, finally with uh, our release of uh, Vim Backup for Microsoft Azure version 7, we are going to support that. So. Uh, talking about this database, so it comes with, uh, you know, depending on your like design of your system, on the application that you're running, it comes with different database engines that you can specify, obviously for, you know, different needs. We're not going to support everything, but we're going to support uh, like most of them with some, um, with, like with some exceptions. Okay. So this is what we're going to support, five of them, starting from Gremlin, going to NoSQL, MongoDB, Postgres, and Table. Uh, speaking of Postgres, um, we're going to like, kind of like, give additional love to Postgres. And uh, whenever I come to the demo part, you'll see what I mean by that. But I can already tell you that we'll have um, additional uh, capability to actually, not only to, to do the snapshots, but also the backups, uh, which means that you can technically targeted to a regular repository and benefit from it. What I mean by that is uh, having immutability for the backups using different um, hot, cool, or archive tiers of uh, Azure backup storage uh, where the data goes to. And then with that, um, we're tapping in into the Azure APIs, obviously, and we're using Azure built-in capabilities. So we're kind of relying on that, but we're giving it some uh, like enhancements, if you say so. For example, with us, we are going to see the um, additional like recovery back to original location, to original cluster, or to new location. And again, once I uh, come to the demo, you'll see see that. Okay, so Veeam is going to support Azure Cosmos DB in next upcoming release. Um, the second thing I would like you to know about is enhancement when we're talking about the virtual, virtual networks. So we've been already supporting it. Um, I don't really remember how many versions, but yeah, we've been supporting it for some time. And now we're giving it a little bit of enhancement. And what I mean by that is you, like prior to that release, um, you know that, well, some of you that used Vim Backup for Microsoft Azure, you know that the data would go actually to Vim configuration database. And it means that it would kind of assume some of the challenges uh, related to possible data, like, um, um, data recovery event. So if you, let's say, if you need to, if you lost the configuration server, management server, and you need to recover your VNet, you would, first of all, you would need to, con to, 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 to recover the server itself, and then you'll be able to kind of to navigate to the data of VNet and to uh, recover it as well. Starting from this version, you're going to have an option within the backup policy wizard uh, to additionally um, move or backup copy the data to a regular repository um, in Azure blob storage, which means that you are not really tied anymore to the management server. And in case of disaster recovery, you are just going to tap into that particular container, Azure blob, and you're going to see the data of VNet and you're going to recover it. So, Think of those scenarios where you know management server is also in danger. It's going to be much easier for you to do the recovery. Um, yeah, once I, I come to the demo, you'll see how like easy it is. Um, so we implemented it in a way that it's you know following the regular backup policy, 
And yeah, it, it should be easy to, for you to kind of to enable the toggle and to activate this option. So that's the second thing. Okay, um, going to the third one, and it's related to worker um, enhancements and how we basically we deal with workers. So the story is like that for previous versions, we, or probably from the very beginning, from version one, we've been trying to, to kind of to, um, to create workers in a backup account, in a backup subscription, which means that um, obviously it wasn't kind of ideal for people looking for more flexibility, for people looking at, um, I don't know, at better billing capabilities. And um, we, like, we, we saw this, uh, this as a temporary limitation, but finally we got the chance to, to kind of to fix it and to make it better for people. Um, so if you want to kind of to imagine what it looks like. Uh, this is how it work, uh, works in like current version, version six. So you've got the Azure VMs, you've got the Azure disks, and you've got the snapshots. Obviously you're trying to protect those VMs. And for all of those operations, obviously you need to process the data, so you need a worker. And Vim backup for Microsoft Azure would go into spin up the worker for this temporary operation and would um, process the data and then would uh, let the worker die. Anyways, right now it's happening in a backup account, but with version seven, a little bit of movement here, so the workers would go to, well, in my case it went to production account, but in your case it would be the account that you can specify, basically anything that you prefer. And with that, we do hope that it would improve your uh, kind of security operations, as well as the billing operations, as well as the kind of the flexibility in terms of what you can do with all the operations that you want to perform with those VMs. All right, um, so let's go to the demo part. Enough of this AWS. <laughs> Uh, now I'm nope. showing you Vim backup for Microsoft Azure, next version. You don't, and you don't see it. I don't, then okay. they don't see it. Right. <laughs> and now you see Vim backup for Microsoft Azure, next version. Um, so kind of following the, um, the general enhancements path, we're also trying to re like factor some of the things and when it comes to, let's say, databases, you know, it used to be like more tabs, like the general tabs um, over there, but then we decided to kind of combine them, to condense them and to, um, to organize something that is specifically directed to databases. And what you can see now is I've got the Cosmos DB under the databases and I've got a couple of backup policies configured. Oh wait, I'm showing you protection data. So let's go to policies and databases and Cosmos DB, okay. Um, so now let's see and let's, let's basically evaluate what we have inside of the backup policy, the, the steps of the wizards which you will have to go through. Um, probably if you use the product and you've been paying attention to what Niels was trying to say, it's kind of the same wizard, right? So you obviously you need to name it properly. You need to specify the account that is required to perform those operations, kind of to run the policy. And then you have to go for the regions. You have to specify um, where you perform those operations. I will try to zoom in and out whenever possible, but sometimes, you know, it gives me a little bit of, uh, it's like a Shakespearean. But it's not about the product, it's about me running the Mac. Um, and then go into resources, so once the regions are identified, so obviously we're tapping in those regions and we can identify the resources. And you always, you have an option to, to basically to protect everything, or you can go ahead and you can specify the specific Cosmos DB account. I've got a couple of accounts. And then from, those, from that account, you can see and you can protect the resources, the actual um, databases, clusters. Oh my God. Um, let's click next. Um, so on the target step, this is very important um, because like I said before, we're going to, tr uh, to treat Postgres differently from the other engines. And you see here that I've got for the backup to repository, it's not being grayed out and I have the backups enabled because for this particular engine, we're going to enable the backups um, of the database. As for the, the retention period, 
um, we're going to have like two options, seven days tier and 30 days tier, with um, again some exceptions when it comes to Postgres, which is 35 days. Don't ask me why it's this, ask Microsoft, um, because we're tapping into to them. Um, and then you obviously you have to uh, define the processing options, like credentials, how we're going to um, talk to the database and what um, actual account, what credentials we can use in order to do that. So uh, it's, it's really easy to, you know, to edit the credentials and to edit. So it's going to be part of the console, so you can use it whenever you need to run the policy. I don't think we have anything like important here for the backup schedule. It's like regular operation where you can basically define your retention, speaking like starting from daily retention and going to weekly, monthly, and yearly. And depending on that, you'll have the, um, you know, the backups associated with that retention policy that you've specified. Um, we have, we have uh, cloud cost optimization session in parallel, but one of the things that they're trying to say <laughs> is this particular screen. I really like that. I like that very much. Oh, no. <laughs> I have to come back. So anyways, we would always try to give you an estimation for the cost associated to running that policy. So also giving you a good heads up um, before you actually configure anything and you uh, go crazy with retention. And then I believe this is, this is it. Okay, so let's go to protected data now and let's navigate to databases and Cosmos DB. What you can see is you can see three accounts that I've been protecting and one of it uh, with Postgres. So which means that I, I can see the recovery points, not only snapshots, but I also see the recovery points. And for this one, I'm going to show you that I've got two options to recover. Basically, point in time recovery. This is something that I'm going to run and recovery from repository, basically tapping in into the backup repository and bringing the, um, the data back to original location or to the new location that I, I will specify. As for the point in time recovery, let me quickly uh, show you the recovery point and how easy for me is to go back in time and to define any day that I want. You know, my policy has been running for some time. So now I've got an interesting calendar option. Okay, hope the server is not disconnected. Which I can apply. And then, for that specific time, you know, the, uh, I specified the day. But now I can go a little bit more granular. And I can just basically use the slider option to, um, to perform the point in time recovery. You know, going back to the, like, the particular second that I want. Um, that's that. Okay, obviously, uh, we're going to use the, um, the account on behalf of which we're going to perform the operation. And then as for the settings, we need to destination to define destination settings, where the data would go to, the resource group and the region. And once I select the region, ah. <laughs> I see this is struggle a little bit. Zooming in and out. Yeah, I can define the, the account name on behalf of which the operation will happen and uh, things like that. Okay, um, let me cancel this wizard because I don't believe we have anything more important here. And go back to the things that I promised. Remember, one, two, and three, Cosmos DB, virtual network, and um, improvements in terms of the, and the worker configuration. So let's go to policy and the policy for virtual network. Um, I've got one policy so I can show you what the difference is. And the difference would be that, you know, everything looks normal. I've got an account on behalf of which, again, I'm protecting. But then I've got the second step. You might know it um, by just by using the like other different wizards. So I can additionally um, enable the backup copy and I can specify a repository where it would go to and I can benefit from all of those repositories that I created, which means that I can use different regions, I can use different immutability configuration option and I could use um, the different access tier, which means that I can, like, at the end of the day, I will pay more or less depending on my needs. And yeah, and it's not, um, again, anyhow, 
related to the management server because I'm doing a little bit of redundancy here, like moving the additional backup of my virtual network into that repository. Okay, let me cancel this. And the third part that I was hoping to show you is related to workers. So let's go to configuration of the backup for Microsoft Azure. And this is what you see a little bit different from what you know these days, right? So you can specify the service account. You can also check uh, its permissions, whether we're actually allowed to, you know, to perform operations uh, on behalf of this account. You can also grant permissions from it, um, from, right from here, um, if, uh, should your account uh, like some of them. And then you can basically, you can decide uh, where your worker configurations are going to be, um, how they're going to look like. So you can create a configuration and you can assign for the service account uh, and it doesn't really matter. It's not like a link to um, the backup account anymore. So that's the third thing I believe is very important for the release. Um, okay, with that, I think we can come back to slides, right? Yes. Yeah, as always, uh, whenever we talk, like me and Niels, whenever we talk to developers and we're being like behind the product, you know, if you don't use it on a daily basis, sometimes, you know, we, give, we go on stage and we say, this new version will be much easier because it would have like a lot of UI and UX enhancements and like reconfigurations. But if you don't do it on a daily basis, you would be like, okay, so that button went somewhere and that button went somewhere. But you know, on the backend side, on the developer side, they've been working hard to make it you know, better. These are more responsive and things like that. So like general perspective is, whenever you have an option to upgrade, please do upgrade because we obviously we work really hard on the backend of the product to make it better with every single version. And yeah, probably, probably one important thing is, uh, yeah, I have, I have to mention that, that we're going to deprecate Service Bus uh, Premium whenever it comes to communication between different, um, different product components, and we're going to use um, storage queues for that. So think about um, backup appliance communicating with workers, and uh, that should potentially result in like less, again, less money you're paying for all the operations associated with it. All right. All right. Um, <clears throat> and the final part before we can jump in Q and A is around platform updates. So um, this morning you also in the se session keynote that like Anton said, we're adding a lot of workloads, a lot of products, etc. And a um, funny remark we had in the past was that Veeam has a lot of consoles and a lot of UIs, right? Um, and there's no difference in this aspect, right? We've got these web UIs for Azure and AWS, which, you know, is good because they're segregated and they're separated and everything is good for a point of security. Um, but what we notice a lot as well is when customers go to the public cloud nowadays, they don't treat the public cloud as a public cloud. They just use it as an extension of their internal cloud. So what we've done in those past things is that we've added abilities like private deployment. So you can go from on-premise to AWS in a fully private deployment with no public connectivity. You know, think about ransomware attacks, etc. And it's all an improvement. But something that we've always done initially when we thought about public cloud, we thought you know customers go public cloud, don't really care that much about the security. Um, boy, did you guys prove us wrong. Um, we initially went to the marketplace, and you could deploy through the marketplace, and things would be taken care of. And then we added an integration with Veeam Backup Application. Works very well, but what we noticed is that our customers were saying, we don't want one single pane of glass, one interface. They care of everything. So Veeam Backup Application will become our main console and our main UI to take care of all these things. So starting from this release, we are introducing a new way of deploying these public cloud products. So no more you know, extra steps of deploying VBR and then going into AWS or Azure Marketplace or the Google Marketplace. Yes, we still have Google. Um, then connect everything together, then change settings because you're running in a private mode. Like, you know, a lot of hassles and basically you go from, let's say, make it a two-step process to like a 50,000 step process. We know we made a mistake there. Um, we're actually enhancing this. So now in this new version with the upcoming uh, update for VBR and our new releases, 
you can just use VBR and say, oh, I got a 10 minute sign, perfect. Um, you can actually go into VBR, say I am working with AWS, and what we will do is we will take care of everything. We will connect to AWS with an account you've provisioned. That's the only thing you will have to do. We will deploy an Ubuntu image, and in the future it may change from Linux versions to be seen, um, just to you know, acknowledge to what you're using. We will talk about that later. And we will deploy this Ubuntu image. We will push everything that's needed to have this product up and running, and you don't have to worry about anything. So if you're running in a private mode, fine. Enable the private mode button. We will make sure that we use private IPs, no public connectivity, no, nothing open on S3, nothing open on the public HTTPS website, you know, no extra rules and configurations for your security teams, or maybe if you're the backup administrator, no extra questions from your security team because, you know, they can be a hassle sometime. Um, but we will take care of everything. And that's what we're moving forward. So over time, um, we will enhance or change the way we're having our appliances, as we call them now. And you will have to actually look at the way we work with AWS and with Azure, that they become like we have VMware proxies, um, or should I say Broadcom proxies nowadays? I mean, I've, I'm confused nowadays. Um, you know, like, just like we've got HAV proxies for the Nutanix users out there, KVM proxies. So basically, our appliances will become a proxy into the public cloud. Whether you're using it publicly or internally, we don't care. We got you covered. Um, what it also will make for you is, of course, simpler management, ease of use, which is very important to us. And when it comes to security, it will make your job easier we will just handle all the questions from those guys for you. So that's pretty much it for our upcoming releases. Um, probably the biggest elephant in the room is when is this all going to be available? A little friend told me that it should be available in Q2 this year. We're in June, you know, two, three weeks, maybe June 31, I don't know. Um, but anyway, by the end of this month, these will all be available. So if you're using Redshift, if you're using FSX, if you're going to Cosmos, uh, if you want additional enhancements and security points, we got you covered by the end of the month. And with that, I will open it up for Q&A. Um, if you're afraid or if you think we're going to throw something, come up to us later. That's fine. Um, we're still here. So, and with that, I also want to thank you all for your attention. <laughs>